We're going to be talking about Articles 37, 38, and 39 today, and we'll try to get up through all three. They're all three related. They're all three basically in a similar vein, similar subject. But I fully believe that this may create a number of questions. So um, I will try to monitor the app a little closer for discussion questions and things like that as well. The last section of the articles, 37, 38, and 39, cover the relationship between the Christian, the church, and the state. At the time of the Reformation, this was a heated and much contested issue. Rome had exercised a good bit of ruling power over England, particularly over the church in England. And England needed to draw some boundaries. And so these are probably the most culturally contextual articles in the whole bunch. Because our situation is going to be very different in some ways from what they were going through in England in the 16th century. My goal is to try to tease out some of the principles in a general sense that they outlined for us. Because we don't, we don't in this country live under a king um, in our civil government. So that's going to be different. The relationship between church and state with England and the Church of England is different. So I want you to think about the stuff I'm about to cover in general terms, just as principles for our relationship today between the church the Christian and the state. All right. So just light, light things like that. No, no big deal. You know, nothing important there. All right. So here is the article 37. I'm not going to read it in its entirety, but I'm going to read the bits that I'm planning on covering. It says this, and this was later in 1801, by the way, amended by the Episcopal Church in, a, in three different articles that tried to contextualize it more to the modern day American thing, but I'm, I'm using the traditional ones for our class, the original 1571 articles. The king's majesty hath the chief power in the realm of England and his other dominions unto whom the chief government of all estates of this realm, ecclesiastical or civil, in, in all causes doth appertain. All right, lots of language there, right? Basically, the, 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 the king, the civil authority, is the civil authority in the realm of England. That's what he's saying. Is not or ought to be subject to any foreign jurisdiction. That is, the sovereignty of, the, of Britain is, belongs to Britain. Okay? Because, remember, Rome had been interjecting herself into British politics and British life not only in an ecclesiastical way over the church, but also in a civil way in, in the idea of rulers and authorities and so forth. So they're, they're saying that, no, that there, there should be the king is the civil authority for us. Where we attribute the king's, to the king's majesty the chief government by which titles we understand the minds of some slanderous folks to be offended, we give not to our princes the ministering of either God's word or of the sacraments. So the reformers are drawing a line and saying the civil authority is the king in this case because we're talking about England. But they, but they do not have the authority to preach the word or celebrate the sacraments. That's the realm of the church. Okay, So they're drawing a distinction between church and state right here. And they call upon the, the, how Elizabeth had done this because this was during Elizabeth's reign. But that only, prerog that only prerogative which we see to have always been given to all godly princes in holy scriptures by, go by God himself, that they should rule all estates and degrees committed to their charge by God, whether they be ecclesiastical or temporal and restrained with the civil sword, the stubborn and the evildoers. <coughs> So they're basically laying out this sense that the civil authority handles the civil matters. They do give certain ecclesiastical rights to the king 
Again, if you know the relationship in England, um, the queen, king in this case now, um, chooses the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, so there's, and the bishops are, are closely related to the, the crown. We do it differently and most countries do it differently. But this again is 1571 Britain, so that's where we are. But they also recognize the authority of the civil authorities for order. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, the next line is the Bishop of Rome hath no jurisdiction in the realm of England. Everybody went, Ooh, right, yay. Um, that, that's twofold in that, in that particular line. is twofold. If a clergyman was guilty of a civil crime, uh, I don't know, say assault, um, the charge prior to this was that the civil court could not try the clergyman. Only the church could try the clergyman. And so they're saying, no, if a minister is involved in a civil matter, assault, let's say, then the civil authorities can prosecute him under civil law. Okay. So they're saying, they're, they're, again, they're, 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 they're saying that Rome, they can't appeal to Rome to get him off of the charge. And that was what was happening. Is that, that they would appeal to Rome and say, you can't, you can't handle this case. They'd appeal to Rome and it would not be it. So that's, why, that's one reason why they're saying that the Bishop of Rome, which is the Pope, has no jurisdiction in this area. All right, the laws of the realm may punish Christian men with death for heinous and grievous offenses. It is, uh, I think that's pretty clear. Um, it is lawful for Christian men at the commandment of the magistrate to wear weapons and serve in wars. I'm going to try to unpack some of those as we go. All right, and I'm going to try not to get in trouble along the way. Because there are some minefields in front of me right now. So, the first thing we need to put in front of us is the reality that Christians have dual citizenship. The English reformers understood that our primary citizenship are as members of the kingdom of God. That's our primary citizenship as Christians. That's what I was talking about in the sermon this morning. But they also understood that while we live in this world, we find ourselves living in a state and a society that is temporal. And so we've got to deal with that. We've got to learn to live in that in some way as Christians in a way that is God-honoring and God-serving. So there's an inherent separation and distinction between the responsibilities of these two organizations, the church and the state. We were created to live in community, in a society, and that society must have order and organization. Civility, a civil society. And typically the way humans have done this has been in some form of government. Some sort of, of usually, hopefully, agreed upon government to manage the civil affairs of society. So that it's not just anarchy and chaos. In the Old Testament, God gave guidance and commandments for the ordering of his society. Think of the law. Think of the Ten Commandments. Which were really the basis of much of British law and American law. Just the Ten Commandments. The biblical principles that we see in Romans 13 and 1 Peter and 1 Timothy are that Christians are called to recognize legitimate civil government and to pray for those who lead it. You'll hear that in the prayers of the people. I mean, it's built into the prayers of the people that we say every week when we pray for the nation, the rulers of the nations and so forth. In one form of the prayers of the people, the other form, there are two forms in the prayer book, the two forms, you actually name the president, um, this form just is more general. And in England in the 1662 book, in the original 1662 book, you prayed for the queen and, and for parliament and so forth. And that's, seen as, that's just seen as biblical. It's not necessarily endorsing anything, it's just saying that scripturally... Romans 13, 1 Peter, 1 Timothy, all speak of praying for our temporal authorities. Okay? 
Doesn't mean you like them all. Point that out. And doesn't mean you like every policy they enact. That's irrespective of our, of our call to pray for them. And sometimes it's hard for people. And I've seen it go back and forth like a ping pong ball, depending on who's in power and who's popular and who's not popular. It does not matter. We pray for our rulers, our government. We, we only call them rulers, but our government authorities. And we pray that God's wisdom, and they would always keep in mind the fact that their power comes from God. That's where it comes from. That's why we pray for them. They will be held accountable for how they rule, how they govern. Okay? So, anyway, I could go off on another sermon on that. I'm going to try not to. I lay out again, that does not mean, just because we pray for them does not mean we agree with them on every point or that we like certain members, certain individual members. No. That's never been the case. Many Christians, in fact, live in places where the civil authorities are, are hostile. Not just incompetent. I'm sorry, that come out. Hostile. Hostile. Where persecution is a real thing. <clears throat> and they pray for their rulers. And they pray for their leaders. So... That's the principle that I want you to understand here is, is that we pray. And I love that, honestly, about the Anglican approach. It's not limited to us, but I love that about the Anglican approach. So your guy may not win the election, but we're still going to pray for the guy who won. My guy may have won. And we'll pray for him. But there, there's no sense of favoritism. There's no sense of aligning within the church a particular direction we pray for our rulers period okay all right um this article also implicitly notes the role of civil government is limited to civil matters the government is not to be exercising influence or dictating the theology of the church its practices or disciplining its leadership those things are under the authority of the church So they don't get to pick our bishops. They don't get to choose our theology. They don't get to adjust our theology. None of that. Okay, That's not within the role of the civil government as it is intended to be. Now likewise, this may be a surprise to some of you, but you may have noticed the church is not to be a political arm or agent of the state either. The church is not to be a political arm or an agent of the state. Have you ever heard Father Wesley or I ever endorse anyone from the pulpit? No. No. A party, a person. No. No. Not going to do it. Privately in my office, if you want to talk about it, we'll talk about it. I'm glad to talk about it. I'll talk your ear off. But the church as an institution is not going to get tied up in the politics of the state. The church is the kingdom of God on earth. It's an outpost of the kingdom of God on earth. So, it's just as we don't want the, the, the government involved in dictating theology and practice within the church, the church as an institution does not look to political means to help it carry out its, its mission to preach and minister the sacraments or to evangelize. Right? So, individuals of the church may of course be politically active, and I would encourage you to be so. But we as an institution do not get intertwined into politics, partisanship, and things such of that nature. Okay? And for some people, that's a great comfort. For some people, it's a bit annoying. And I've heard from both of you um, over the years. Some people want us to come out very strongly one way or the other on a candidate. 
or on a particular thing. And I'll, make, I'll tell you the exceptions to this rule um, in just a moment. But think about this in terms of political, political activity, individual members. William Wilberforce in England, in the late 19th century, he became a Christian, became an evangelical Anglican. And he wanted and really contemplated very strongly going into ministry. He was a member of parliament and wanted very strongly to go into ministry, felt called to that. Felt like that's what he ought to do. And he was convinced, and I'm, oh, I want to say it was John Newton, but I'm not positive, who wrote Amazing Grace, who, but I could be wrong. Um, one of the Anglican leaders convinced him to not go into the ministry. Minister where you are. The church needs you there, Right? And so Wilberforce led the charge for the end of the slave trade in England. Okay, so his Christian convictions led him to end what was a terrible injustice within England because he was active in this realm in this way. And if you ever haven't read this story or seen the, they made a movie about it that's pretty decent about Wilberforce. He's an Anglican, and a lot of people don't know about him, but he was instrumental in ending the sla African slave trade in England. And he died, I think it was a week before they passed the final resolution. He spent his life working for that. So. There is, my point in telling Wilberforce's story a little bit is to say there is a place for that, for that type of involvement, yes. And for influence, yes. But institutionally, think about Nazi Germany. When the church got intertwined into politics in Nazi Germany, it went terribly wrong. It usually does. So that's why we tend to avoid it. There will be times, and here's the exception, when the church in the due course of preaching the truth will run afoul of the government. And that just has to be the way it is. Because we're going to preach the truth. We're going to preach the scriptures. We're going to preach the kingdom. And there will be times when that runs afoul of the government. Whatever government we're talking about. Particularly this concerns issues of moral questions that impact the church or members of the state. Short list, abortion, sexuality, euthanasia, immigration, war, poverty, education. These are all places where the church and state may be in conflict. And okay, that'll be the way it is. So there will be times when we have those types of discussions. There will be times when the church comes under fire for upholding the biblical truths of the kingdom. But we must uphold the biblical truths of the kingdom. So, but that is, is different from becoming some sort of partisan party at prayer. Okay, that's a different thing. We're talking about particular moral issues that we need to address as a society. Um, because the truth is, God's law is applicable to all of humanity, whether they realize it or not. And I had, I had high schoolers that, that, that often got tripped up by that statement. So I tell them, if you're driving in a 35 mile per hour, why do all my examples involve speeding? I just realized that. So you're driving in a 35 mile per hour zone, but you're doing 55. You miss the change. You ever miss the speed change? You miss the sign? And suddenly, you were in a 55. It switches to 35 and you don't realize it. Can you get a ticket for that? Of course. Because objectively, the speed changed. Even though you didn't see it, and you can claim ignorance, 
Doesn't matter. You get a ticket for it. God's laws are likewise applicable to all humanity. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Whether they want to recognize that or not. Okay? So the church is called to continue to pronounce and preach those things even when it runs afoul of popularity or the government. The redefining of marriage is a great example by the Supreme Court in Overfall. Okay? We're going to preach against that. Okay? Because it's contrary to the, to the, to the laws of God. So, um, th- times like that will happen. And I hope you understand the difference that I'm talking about between um, political endorsement and involvement versus moral questions and moral issues that come up that we have to address. Okay? And just me personally, there ain't a lot of difference in some cases. In some cases. All right. Um, Between right and left. But again, you didn't ask, so I won't talk. When things like this happen, Christians are called to have a prophetic voice for the betterment of society. Christians are called to have a prophetic voice for the betterment of society. Not an arrogant voice, not a condemning voice, not a hateful voice, but a voice for the betterment of society. It is always better to live the way God has told his people to live. It is never a blessing to ignore that. It's never blessed humanity to ignore that. So, there are times when we would be called to have a prophetic voice. There is a time for civil disobedience. But we also recognize at the same time that if we do that, then we ought to expect the civil response. Fines, imprisonment, that is in keeping with our beliefs about the civil authority. So, that may happen. But generally, generally, what the articles are trying to show us is that temporal things are are typically the realm of civil authority. Spiritual things are typically the realm of the church. The note about the Bishop of Rome, I already mentioned that about the clergy breaking a civil law to be disciplined by civil authorities. Um, But I think it was just fun for the reformers to put that line in there. They've been wanting to say that for 30-something articles, and they found a way to work it in. The the Bishop of Rome have no authority in this jurisdiction. All right. And then finally, this article attests that Christians may serve in the police or military. That was debated for a while, particularly in the early church. Um, but there are good biblical grounds for, the, for service in the military or service in the police, armed, some sort of armed service. Um, not all Christians agree on that, so I will point that out in some of these things, that there are differences among faithful Christians on some of these things, and that is fine. But the articles clear the way for that type of, of service. All right. Article 38 of Christian Men's Goods. Your stuff. What the articles say about your stuff. The riches and goods of Christians are not common as touching the right title and possession of the same as certain Anabaptists do falsely boast. Notwithstanding, every man ought of such things as he possesseth liberally to give alms to the poor according to his ability. So this article is a specific reaction to some, not all, some of the Anabaptists Is that Marty Thompson coming in the back door? Everybody give her a hand. We love you. We're glad you're here. All right, so this article is a reaction to some of the Anabaptists at the time who took Acts 4, where the disciples held everything in common. It tells that we held all things in common and shared as those had need as being prescriptive for all Christians everywhere at all times, okay? There's a principle in hermeneutics called proscriptive and descriptive scripture. So sometimes scripture is just describing what happened, and sometimes scripture is saying this is prescriptive for all Christians at all times. Typically, Acts 4 was never thought of as to be prescriptive. 
at all times to all people and all Christians in all places. And so the, the reformers said, no, no, that's not prescriptive. And that we see plenty of examples in Scripture of people that owned property, people that were wealthy. Nicodemus comes to mind who gave the tomb for Jesus himself out of his wealth. And so there's also a Gnostic piece that goes along with this, that it runs underneath this, that we still struggle with. This idea that if it's physical, it's bad. If it's spiritual, it's good. That's, a, that's sort of a Gnostic view. It's, that affects our view of sexuality. That affects our view of money. It affects our view. We, we, we tend to think badly about physical things. That's Gnosticism. That's not Christianity. Christianity redeems, Jesus redeems the physical. Bread and wine become the instruments of his body and blood to feed us. Water becomes an instrument of baptism into new life. And so likewise, the physical sexuality becomes a celebration of the covenant between husband and wife. There's, there's this redemption of the physical that we see. And so this article is tapping into that and trying to help us avoid this idea of, of, of stuff being evil in and of itself. The key to Acts 4 is to understand that it was a voluntary act. I've also heard people try to use Acts 4 as an argument for socialism, um, which is a poor hermeneutic to say the least. Acts 4 was a voluntary thing that was done by converts to Christianity who had overstayed in Jerusalem to stay there additional time to be with the apostles. And so they pooled their resources together in order to help them live while they stayed in Jerusalem additional time. So it's a specific situation that they were in. Not a bad idea on the one hand, but to understand that it was voluntary is different from saying that this is required of all Christians everywhere to do. Okay? So... Otherwise, it makes no sense what Jesus said to the rich young ruler, right? To, to, to sell all you have. And it makes no sense why he was upset by that if he didn't own stuff, right? And it makes no sense for Jesus to constantly talk to us about money and about giving generously and sacrificially to the poor and things such as that if that were not going to be the case. So anyway, that's that. Um, scripture assumes that God's people will own personal property and may have wealth. But the call in this article is that the Christian will give generously from whatever they have to support others in need. That's the call. That, and that's a high call. When you really work through, particularly Corinthians, and look at what the Scriptures are saying to us in regards to our giving, it is a high call indeed that we are given in terms of generosity. So, and that is a spiritual discipline. And that is a spiritually rewarding and gracious act. So, that's what that article is, is primarily talking about. Um, if you have any questions, you can throw them in the app or email me or talk to me afterwards. Oaths. The last article. Yay. I'm going to do it. We're going to run to church, but I'm going to do it. As we confess that vain and rash swearing is forbidden Christian men by our Lord Jesus Christ and James' his apostle, so we judge that Christian religion doth not prohibit that a man may swear when the magistrate requireth in a cause of faith and charity so it be done according to the prophet's teaching Injustice, judgment, and truth. All right, real quick. The word swearing in this article is not the same as profanity. That's not what they're talking about. Just so you know and so we're clear, the Scripture does encourage us not to be profane. And that unwholesome talk, profanity, is not to be the Christian's habit. Swearing here is referring to the taking of an oath particularly. We are, of course, told by Jesus to let our yes be yes and our no be no. Our lives are meant to be full of integrity and truth as a matter of course, as a matter of being a Christian. 
so that we have no need to take an oath to attest to our truthfulness. It should be just part of the Christian's life, the sense of being truthful. Generally speaking, we do not take vain or rash oaths. And those are serious things. Oaths are an assertion of loyalty or of a promise or truthfulness where one does so by calling on the name of God to be the witness to that. So, first of all, to do it, whatever you're doing or saying must be congruent with the word of God. Meaning I cannot take a vow that is contrary to Scripture or teaching or promise something that is, that is contrary to Scripture. So it's a serious thing to ask God to hold us accountable for whatever oath we are making. So while we do not do them, while we actually have for mistaken oaths, sometimes involved in secret societies, we actually have deliverance prayers to break those oaths. All right, so a vow is simpler. A vow is made to God, but it must be congruent with Scripture. Think of your marriage vows. Those are vows made to God on behalf of your spouse. Okay? So what the article is saying, basically, in a a nutshell, is that there may be times when the civil authorities require an oath, particularly in terms to give testimony in court. And it says that in that case, since the truth is what we are after, and because we are affirming and attesting to the truth of whatever situation, we may take that oath with a clean conscience. You know, hand on the Bible, I do solemnly swear to tell the whole truth, blah, blah, blah. But we may take that oath. Also, when one takes some sort of official office, there's an oath to fulfill one's duty to the best of one's ability, such as an enlistment of a soldier or the taking of a public office by, a, by, someone, by some particular leader. But this article is also saying that we do not have to do these things. Okay? It says that we may, not that we have to. So some Christians elect not to take oaths at any time. In the army, when I was in the army, you could do an enlistment in two ways. You could do the I solemnly swear to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States, or you could say I do solemnly affirm to uphold the Constitution. They've, many places have built that in now where you don't have to do it. That's fine. The reformers simply affirm that in pursuit of truth in particularly, it is possible for a Christian to make that kind of oath. Okay? Just that it's possible, not that it's required. Have we done it? Have we made it? 18 weeks, 39 articles. I hope it's been helpful. Let's do it again. All right, Article 1. Thank you all for coming and being a part of this. If there are ways I can improve this class, I'll do it again at some point. It'll be a while. The videos are out there. You're welcome to watch the videos. But um, I hope it's been helpful to dive into the doctrine of the church and to dive into the doctrine of the 39 articles. So uh, if you've been to church, have a wonderful and blessed week. If you are going to church, you better beat me there. you got seven minutes. Love you. See you in a bit.